Hey everyone, uh, today we're beginning our 14th lecture and our discussions about religion in the United States. And for today's lecture, we're going to be covering a whole host of things, really getting to the modern period, closer and closer to our day and time, and uh, how the churches or religion here in America reacted to modernity. And so specifically, we're going to be talking about the Catholic Church again um, and that the, uh, the reaction that the church had with Vatican II, which has significantly changed the church and that the church is still uh, within a revolution with the election of um, Pope Francis with the outcomes of Vatican II and why it was so important. And we'll discuss this fact as well as we'll talk about the issue of sexuality within the church and also the child abuse scandal that had rocked the Catholic Church here recently and that the church is still um, trying to recover from here in the United States. Uh, and then finally, in our lecture, we're going to be talking about what I consider the third wave of new religious movements. And we're going to be talking specifically about cults uh, and the emergence of these either personality cults or these kind of cult-like religions. And we're going to focus on three uh, particular New Age religions that kind of emerged since the 1950s uh, here in America and how much significantly d different they are and kind of talk about them. All right. So as always, let's let's start here. And let's start right away with the Catholic Church. And we need to talk about what the Catholic Church was like um, prior to uh, Vatican II. So following after World War II, the Catholic Church was really hit with a, so a, a kind of slow eroding trend, as I had here. Not only in terms of membership, but in terms of revenue, in terms of support, turns on um, just everything on a global scale and there were several reasons for that and the church started to look inward shortly after World war ii to try to discover why was that first there was dramatic declines in conversion rates which were paralleled by the natural decline of birth rates and immigration to the you know various countries where the catholic you know catholic church was dominant so really europe but also here in america but and there's a significant reason as to why was that world war ii had just happened and you know several millions of people had died due to the war and so here in the united states it was dramatic numbers um, more specifically for us dramatic decline in conversion rates declining in birth rates declining in immigration rates for catholics and so subsequently because there's not enough catholics being born there's also not enough sim you know people catholics uh, who want to be priests and or nuns attending seminaries and so if you don't have enough priests you can't fill all the positions and so there was just a natural decline across the board in europe as well as in the united states but particularly in the United States, which didn't happen in, in Europe, the Catholic Church was suffering from another problem that was more minute to the United States. And that was the problem of white flight. And if you're not familiar with the term of white flight, uh, this is a term that refers to uh, groups of Americans in a period in American history, really starting in the 1930s, but really is after World War II of Americans because of forced immigration, white Americans because of forced immigration of the schools, um, of county, you know, city districting where neighborhoods lied and, and stuff like that and jobs, forced integration in jobs. A lot of Americans started to leave the inner cities and started to leave the urbanization that was the growing trend from, you know, from America after the Civil War to now they're going to the suburbs and going out to the country. And it was directly because of integration, because of Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. And then later this, uh, the Civil Rights Acts that were passed, a lot of white Americans were leaving the public schools because of fear of having their you know, little Johnnies and little Susies going to school with a black person. And so we have the rise of sur suburban areas and some suburban cities uh, really emerging. So, for example, when I lived 
in Raleigh, North Carolina, the city of Cary, which is a suburb, was a very small village, didn't have many people. But you look at the statistics rate and starting in the 1960s, the city of Cary exploded and it was dominated by white class people who were leaving the city of Raleigh, going to the nearest suburb, which was Cary, because they didn't want their children to go to schools with black children. And so the inner city churches, particularly the Catholic church, which was dominant within these uh, inner cities uh, centers because of immigration and because of urbanization, it left many of the Catholic parishes in significant financial strain because money is basically leaving the cities and the only one that are left are poor people. And they're, you know, the Catholic churches or the Catholic dioceses are being forced to build new sanctuaries out in the suburbs in order to reach their congregants, but also trying to maintain older buildings that are starting to dilapidate. And so it was a huge significant problem on the Catholic church. Also, many Catholics starting after World War II began to lapse, so to say, or left the church due to much of the atrocities happening in World War II, whether outside of the church, but also within the church. Um, it led to, because again, the massive amount of people dying, the massive amounts of, you know, these Christian, so-called Christian nations, the UK, an Anglican nation, where the Queen of England sits as the head of the Church of England. Germany, Hitler also sat as the head of the German church, of the Lutheran church in Germany. And then you had Italy with uh, Benito Mussolini and the Pope, you know, the Catholic churches. So you had churches and Christians fighting other Christians and you had Christians massacring like the German Nazis massacring Jews. And so it led a lot of people to question, is there a God, questions religion's place in society, in the modern world. And so a lot of people, including Catholics, began to leave the churches due to the things that were being seen uh, going on in the world today. But also, too, there was a big conspiracy that was hinted at in the 1940s, but then later confirmed in the 1970s and 80s, uh, that the Vatican, or particularly Pope Pius, had was complicit in uh, much of the atrocities of the Holocaust. And what I mean by that is that the Catholic Church did nothing, did absolutely nothing about what was going on with Hitler, what was going on with the persecution of the Jews, that they knew about it. And you can see here, this is Pope uh, Pius. This is when he was a cardinal and he was a German and he was in Germany uh, as a cardinal, Cardinal Priscelli, and he was uh, close friends with Adolf Hitler prior to him becoming the Pope of the Church. And so he had, you know, the Pope and the papacy had a friendly relationship with Hitler as well with Mussolini. And so it led a lot of people, particularly here in America, who were Catholics or not Catholics, saying, you know, WTF here. What the hell? And so you had a lot of Catholics going to um, Italy and subsequently, you know, they're fighting Mussolini and fighting the Italians, uh, the Italian fascists, but they're also fighting the Catholic Church. So again, it led a lot of people to have a lot of doubt. So it's just massive amounts of decline in interest in the Catholic Church across the globe, but more specifically in America uh, for our discussions. But however... Following the the election of Pope John uh, the 23rd here, uh, the Pope surprised everyone because he was supposed to be very much a conservative, very much a moderate, um, and somewhat uh, not to cause ways after the death of Pope Pius, who was very controversial, had a lot of question marks, and he also ruled for a very long time as the papacy for over 20-something years because he was elected very young. And so um, Pope John was very old when he got elected. You can see his papacy only lasted a few years because he was very old. Um, but he surprised everyone because no one thought he was going to act. Um, but he did act. And so in one of his papal addresses in, in 1959, in it he surprised everyone by calling forth for a general church council. And he said in his papal speech that for the sole purpose of, quote, 
needing at the present time a new enthusiasm within the church, a new joy and a new sincerity of mind. And so subsequently, two years later, what had happened was is that the Pope was able to convene and call for a church-wide meeting of over 5,000 at one point, 5,000 priests and church membership from all over the globe coming to the Vatican for a several period of time to talk about how to reform the church. And so this became known as the Second Vatican Council in Rome between the years of 1962 up until 1965. And so it's the Second Vatican Council, and unlike its first predecessor, the first Vatican Council that was called forth by another pious, um, the first Vatican Council was called specifically by the papacy and by the Catholic Church to combat liberalism, to combat, to push back modernity and its you know, tentacles and how it was seeping in and changing society and changing the church. And, oh, it's just so, it's so unbelievable that it's advocating, you know, liberalism and modernity is advocating for women's right, for women to have the vote. This is just unheard of or advocating for democracy to get rid of the monarchy, to get rid of hierarchical styles of governments and make them more, make them more um, democratic or more Republican in nature. And he's, the Catholic Church was saying, this is, oh my God, we can't have this. So they call at Vatican at Vatican I, they call a church council for the sole purpose of we've got to per, per, uh, get together. We've got to, to make and pre, uh, prepare a defense against the rise of liberalism in Europe and in America. Vatican II, you know, appropriately named, was its complete opposite. The sole purpose, as I have here, and what uh, Pope John Paul the Twenty Third, and then later, um, or, or not John Paul, but John the Twenty Third, and then later Pope Paul, what he, what they both wanted to do was they wanted to bring the church, the Catholic Church, even if it had to be kicking and screaming, into the modern world, because it was dying, because declining numbers here, because of white flight, because of all the the shit that was going on that the Catholic Church allowed to happen during World War II, many within the church saying enough is enough. We've got to reform. We've got to welcome and got to be active members of a modern world in a brand new world. So it took guts and it took leadership. And so we have Vatican II, which is profoundly important within the Catholic Church, but also the Catholic Church here in America. And why is it? Why is Vatican II so important? And why are we talking about this in the United States of America, a global thing? Well, the reason is, is because much of the initiatives and much of the expectations and much of the reforms that many people wanted within the Catholic Church, particularly here in our discussion of religion in America, much of the reforms were actually what American Catholics were, were doing and wanting of the Catholic Church back in the, seven, in the 18th century, in the 1700s. So we're talking about, you know, back to our first couple of lectures when we were talking about John Carroll and the American English Catholics, what they were wanting. Vatican II was finally the fulfillment of that. And so really what well, why Vatican II is so important. A lot of Catholic scholars miss this point. Or maybe I'm overemphasizing because I'm overemphasizing the role that America has played in the world. But I think it's true. What Vatican II represents is the Americanization of the Catholic Church. A small fraction, even though the changes that Vatican II brought about within the Catholic Church is they're very small, but it was everything that American Catholics, original American Catholics, you know, you know, again, John Carroll and the 1700s and early, early 1800s that we talked about very early on of Catholics in America, everything that they were wanting, lay leadership, more Republican style forms of government, less um, you know, less oversight by archbishops and giving more and more power to the individual church and having the individual church held responsible to local governments and having congregations more included in church services. That's what Vatican II ultimately promoted and did. 
So again, why is Vatican II so important? Is because it blended many aspects of the Americanist controversies that we've been talking about with the Catholic Church on a global scale. So as I say here, the Catholic Church came a bit Americanized after so many decades of resisting Americanism, resisting uh, uh, Enlightenment philosophy and Enlightenment systems of thought and Enlightenment forms of government, the Catholic Church is finally embracing it and, and becoming a little more Americanized. So what, did, what is Vatican II? Why is it so, so, so important? Well, first, I'm not going to, you know, we're not going to do much of the Latin phrases here. You're not, you know, you really don't need to know this. But Vatican II, they issued, because it was a, such a long meeting, over four, three years, three years that they met uh, at various different points in the years. And after every meeting, they would put out a statement. And so these are all these statements that have coalesced into something. And so these are various statements. And of course, it's the Catholic Church. The statements have to be written out in Latin and pronounced in Latin. And then, you know, so I'm translating them for you. But from these two documents, and they're all from different times, from either 62, 63 to 64 to 65, they all are coming out at different times. And so I'm pulling them together, but we have Apostolium Acatosotium and Christius Dominius. Both of these, what they were advocating for was one, these two documents, you know, separately put out different times. But one, what these two documents did was they recognized and permitted and encouraged cooperation with the laity. So non-priests, non-monks, non-bishops, non-nuns. The average people in the pews, they gave them more cooperation and more aspects of involvement in various aspects of the church, whether it's in certain aspects of liter of the leadership, you know, that the church has, you know, the, the, the local congregants there have more say in how the church is to be run, how its property is to be maintained and managed versus somebody, uh, you know, like, for example, here, you know, St. John's or St. Dominic's here in um, uh, Panama City that, you know, the archbishop, the person who, or not the archbishop, but the local bishop here uh, is all the way in Tallahassee. So what this did was saying instead of the bishop in Tallahassee saying and running the church and saying how the churches should be run here in Panama City or in Fort Walton or Pensacola, um, instead... It is the local congregation. It's the people at St. John's that say how we really want the church to be run on a more individual level, uh, but also in terms of worship as well. And so I say here, one big thing that it did was that um, previously the priest would never face the congregation when he was performing the mass. Every you had to, if you went to a Catholic church back in the night, you know, prior to 1966. You would have to look at the back of the priest's back and his head, his bald head or his, you know, his, you know, his uniform, everything you looked behind him. He never at one time looked to the audience when he was performing the sacred rites for the Eucharist. Now they reversed it. The priest, they moved the altar and instead of the altar being at against the wall at the very back of the church. They moved the altar a little bit up and they allowed the priest to go behind the altar and he's facing the congregants. And so the congregants are able to participate in the most you know, beautiful aspect of the Catholic Church, that being the Mass. Also, a big aspect was the use of vernacular languages. So English was to be used during church services. So hymns, instead of being sung in Latin or sung in your native language you know, of Germany, but you're here in America, no, in America, most churches, you were t supposed to be using the vernacular language of English. So, um, you know, hymns were being sung in English. Prayers were being done in English. Scripture readings were being done in English. And also the sermon that the priest would give was done in, in English. Uh, so that was a big change and increased participation. More songs, more biblical readings, and also today, if you go to a Catholic church, there'll be members of the congregants will come up and read passages from the Bible or lead the people in singing instead of the priest. So again, 
huge changes in the Catholic Church. But you know, for us, if you're a, if you know, or if you're a Protestant, you're like, well, that's not big changes. For the Catholic Church, that was mo- monumentous. And so also, too, uh, it placed uh, another thing these two documents did. Uh, it was placed a lot of emphasis on collegiality, meaning that the Catholic Church was to be run by a conference of bishops while the Pope presided over this con- you know, con- uh, conference of bishops, but still the bishops are, and the Pope had equal footing on each other. They were all uh, um, first among equals among each other the pope might have veto power but typically he never exercises it that much so it gave more power to the bishops and it started to limit the power of the papacy which was a huge problem for a lot of americans or people who originally came to america to escape persecution was the uncontrollable power that was with the papacy here the pope is powers are being limited which again was something that a lot of americans wanted so another thing, and these are a couple of different doc, uh, documents that were passed, Orientum, Ecclesiarum, uh, Iudatatus, um, Reg de Garantio, uh, and Nostra Ate. Uh, one of the significant things that at first it recognized, uh, uh, Nostra Ate, it recognized the rights of Eastern Catholics, Catholics that lived in China. Catholics that lived in Turkey, Catholics that lived in Syria, Catholics that, that lived in Palestine, um, you know, that they were living in what is known as the East, that they, they weren't westernized, they weren't using Latin scripts, they weren't using Latin in their services, they were using different traditions, traditions that are not found in Rome, and for a long time the Catholic Church thought of them as non-Christians or non-Catholics, that changed. After Vatican II, now Eastern Catholics are considered Catholics. They're brought into the, the family, but the Pope doesn't have any say over these churches. The churches can still operate as they have for centuries. Uh, and also a renewed dialogue between the Latin Church, and what I mean by that, between uh, the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. So you have really since the 1960s that whoever's the Pope always talks to whoever is the patriarch of Constantinople or the Greek Orthodox Church. They talk frequently. They have meetings together very frequently. And so this is something that is new, a new dialogue. It also, um, what was significant too, is it promoted uh, a fancy word, ecumenicalism, which means cooperation between churches or religious groups. So it promoted ecumenicalism, and it recognized that Protestants are Christians. For a long time, and there's some Catholics still to this day, if you talk to them, will not recognize a Christian, a Protestant, as a Christian because he didn't have a baptism by a priest. It wasn't presided over the priest, or the Eucharist wasn't presided over by a priest. His marriage wasn't presided over a priest. That has changed in the Catholic Church. Um, by and large, Protestants are considered Christians. They're not considered Catholic. But they are considered Christians, and so therefore it created a new sense of dialogue. Um, unfortunately, there's still a lot of Protestant churches, for example, like uh, the Southern Baptist Church denomination or Pentecostals. Um, uh, Mormons for a long time, but they've changed that too. Uh, never considered uh, the, ca- the Catholic Church as being Christians. And so, like again, there's some, Protest- there's some Baptists um, that will say no all Catholics are not Christians, that they're all going to hell because they're not Protestant. Um, But hopefully that will change over time. But this is something great and something different. And so that Protestants now, the 500-year war between Protestants and Catholics is uh, is officially over, at least on the Catholic side. And hopefully it will be over between the Protestants one day. And the church, the Catholic church, also acknowledged that it had centuries, 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 of anti-Semitism, and uh, uh, Unitatis um, uh, re- de, uh, Reintegratio, part of it, was that it asked for forgiveness from the Jewish com- community, and particularly also the Jewish community for Holocaust, that it admitted its failures, admitted its abilities of inaction, its unwillingness to act, and it asked for forgiveness for the Jews. Um, which was uh, very powerful in my mind. 
that the Catholic Church finally admits that it's had a history of promoting anti-Semitism in its doctrines and its teachings and has since the 1960s has reversed a lot, a lot of the anxiety and the problems that the Jews and the Catholics have faced um, for a long time. And also, too, particularly with um, Nostra Ate, uh, that advocated for more embracing of modernity. Instead of attacking it and running away from it, the Catholic Church was to run, was to dialogue with it. So you have subsequently after this in Vatican, there's many priests who, there are priests, ordained priests, who also go, after they finish seminary, they go on to get a master's degree in chemistry or a PhD in astrophysics. And so you have Catholic priests who are working in the field of science. You have Catholic priests who are becoming doctors in some places because they're embracing modernity and seeing that their role as ministers evolves. And so you have a lot, again, like a lot of Catholics have no issues with with evolution, with what science is doing. The Catholic Church has seemed to embrace uh, all the science, scientific revolutions minus, you know, the issue of abortion. Um, but it has embraced a lot of what science is doing. And so the Protestant church is slowly catch, catching back up to this. But it is interesting. And so, again, the Catholic church has advocated for embracing modernity instead of attacking it or running away from it, as it has traditionally done for thousands, you know, for hundreds of years. And so here's some more um, documents as well. These were some others. Agentes, um, Perfectiae, Cartiestis. And dignitas humanae, uh, and so what it was was fundamentally it repurposed the church towards evangelization and creating welfare programs. So this is after the 1960s. You have, you know, ca the Catholic Church creating charity programs like, um, you know, uh, Catholic uh, wellness groups. And so, for example, here in Panama City, after uh, Hurricane Michael ravaged through the area. One of the first boots on the ground, just, you know, distributing supplies was Catholic Charities of America. Uh, you know, a lot of hospitals here in America, a lot of privatization, private, privatized hospitals here in America are run by the Catholic Church. And so, again, the Catholic Church is outside of the federal government here in America is the largest social welfare program or group of companies or businesses in America. So the Catholic Church has re-fundamentally re purposed itself to be more and more about welfare and more about charity and more about social programs and social Christianity that we discussed, uh, whereas the Protestant Church is, is kind of still divided on that issue. And the Catholic Church also recognized and, and will fight for religious freedoms and individual choice. Um, so this was very big, particularly during communism, because this was the Catholic Church's way of fighting against communism. And the Catholic Church was fundamental, particularly Pope John Paul III, was fundamental in the fall of communism in Eastern Europe. It really wasn't Ronald Reagan. It was the Catholic Church. Um, I know it breaks our American myth, you know, myth, uh, mythology about Ronald Reagan and about what we've done, which I mean, you know, don't get me wrong, you know, the Amer you know, Americanization and industrialization and the American, you know, the military industrial complex and what Reagan did were significant, but on the ground, it was the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church was always still there, particularly in Poland and in Ukraine. Um, and Hungary, Serbia, areas that started to revolt. And we look at the, the, the leaders, the freedom fighters that were revolting against the Communist Party. They were strong Catholic leaders. And so it was the Catholic Church that was, uh, was fundamental in the fall of communism. Um, and so you have that too. So like, for example, here in America, um, you know, shortly when, um, when, when uh, President Trump issued his famous um, ban on Muslims, one of the first voices of opposition against uh, President Trump or that, that, that rule was Pope Francis, who is fighting not for Catholics. That's supposed to be his job is to fight for Catholics here in America and advocate for Catholic freedoms and Catholic uh, principles. 
But instead, he was fighting and arguing for Muslims, for their right to believe what they want to believe here in America. So again, like I said, that's one example of the Catholic Church is something that has changed. That the Catholic Church is fighting for Muslims now, and the, you know the Pope has been been very outspoken um, for Muslim communities in Italy too, because there's massive amounts of uh, Muslim persecution in Italy, um, and the Catholic Church and the Pope is on the forefront of fighting that cause. But probably the biggest, which is number four, and it gets quoted a lot. And so if you listen to this talking about a lot of Catholics, and I think it's mentioned in your textbook as well, the, the, this phrase that gets repeated over and over and over and over again, and particularly you heard it a lot with the election of Pope Francis here recently in 2015 or 16, um, you know, this phrase, in the spirit of Vatican II. And what this is, is, so this is from a famous ch Catholic Church historian that talks about why uh, Vatican II is so, so important in, in world history. So he says, quote, it was as though the world, or at least church history, meaning Catholic history, were now to be divided into two periods, pre-Vatican II and post-Vatican II. Everything pre was pretty much dismissed so far as the authority mattered for the most extreme to be a Catholic now meant to be meant to believe more or less anything one wished to believe in, or at least in the sense in which one personally interpreted it. One could be Catholic in spirit. One could take Catholic to mean the culture of Catholicism in which one is born into rather than it to mean a creed. So basically what Vatican II is, what he's really saying here, the church became kind of Protestantized and Americanized. So like here in America, most Americans don't identify with the specific denomination of Christianity. If you ask them, they'll just say, I'm Christian. And you ask them what you believe in, and you know they might go to a Baptist church, but then or, uh, uh, they might go to a Pentecostal church, but then you start asking, really, what do you believe in? You know, they don't believe in the creeds and the doctrines of the Methodist church or the Presbyterian church. They go because they like the community or they like the culture. And so you see that as well being played out in the Catholic church. So a lot of Catholics are starting to abandon traditions of church doctrine. And the reason that they stay Catholic is they like the culture. And so you have here the kind of Protestantization of the Catholic church, but really because um, that's what he would argue, the author of this uh, excerpt, this is the Protestantization of Catholic Church. But for me, it's no, it's the Americanization of the Catholic Church. Because again, the Protestant Church in, in, here in America is not so creedal. It's more about culture. So again, this is why Vatican II is so, so important. But it's also important because of the reactions to Vatican II that we have had since 1965. So with the result of Vatican II, it was also, it created dissidents immediately within the Catholic Church, both on the right side of the aisle, as well as on the left side of the aisle. So from the perspective of the right, of, from conservative Catholics, uh, for many, Vatican II represents a complete contradiction to the whole of church tradition, to the whole of Catholicism because it decentralizes church supremacy over other religions, as you saw there. Protestants are Christians. Eastern Orthodox are Christians. Jews, uh, the Catholic Church also said that Jews will uh, go to heaven as well, as according to Paul, um, that Jews' faith is legitimate too. And they were wrong in saying that. And some Catholics are saying, no, 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 this is not so. And so they argue and said what, Vatican II does, it promotes, which is a common phrase that you hear within uh, Catholicism, cafeteria Catholicism. And what that phrase means, basically, it's very popular here in America, but what that means is like at a, at a cafeteria. If you go to Golden Corral, for example, it's a buffet. You go to a Chinese buffet. That's what it's talking about. The purpose of it is you go so you can pick the food you want to eat. So you might like chicken. You might like mac and cheese, but you hate spinach. You hate broccoli. Or you might like, um, you know, um, sesame, sesame chicken, 
but you you know you but you really like pie, pad thai so that's why you go to a chinese buffet because you can get what you want while somebody else gets what they want and you're all happy and everything's mosey and he's like no no conservative catholics were screaming this is not the tradition of catholicism this is not what we're supposed to be everything there's it's an absolute catholicism is the true form of christianity so they resisted you know some of them you know kind of violently against it so there's some that who denied vatican II. And so in 1965, literally 1965, after the passage of Vatican II, here in America, many American Catholics came together uh, in New York City, and they created a new movement within the Catholic Church here in America, the Catholic Traditionist Movement, um, which is its own denomination in a way of Catholicism that's not recognized by the Catholic Church as a whole, but here in America, it is by the American Diocese of Catholic, Catholic Churches. It is. But anyhow, uh, but they issued their own manifesto, their own creeds, in which it rejected Vatican II as progressive, as liberalism invading the church and just ruining America, just ru ruining everything. And they decided to keep the old traditions. So you'll have some churches that you go here, to, you know, if you go to some Catholic churches um, in the Northeast or up in Ohio. Um, they will have churches where this is the traditional form, like I say here, of Catholic services, where again, the priest is never facing you. Everybody, you know, all his uh, deacons and his, church, his uh, helpers, they never face you, the audience. They always face the altar and face God. Um, and they, there are some places, you know, in Ohio, New York, Boston, Baltimore area, that the priest will still speak only in Latin. Because, again, there are some elements. They keep, want to keep the old traditions. And many Catholics here in America also reject the papacy of Pope Paul, who was the second pope right after um, uh, John the Twenty Third died. And he was the one that presided over the finishing parts of um, Vatican II. And some people say it's really Pope Paul instead of John who slipped in all the liberal elements to Vatican II. But I would argue... Um, no, John would have done it too. Um, and so who, uh, so they don't support him. And, and also what you have is because of that, because of Paul, and he, you can see here, he lived for a very long time as Pope. Uh, the Catholic Church reacted harshly to the liberalization of the Catholic Church. And so in subsequently, you have the election of three popes, Pope John Paul I, Pope John Paul II, and uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, who were all extremely conservative popes, who all hated Pope Benedict said he never hated, but how he acted and responded to it hated Vatican II, and fought avidly to reverse many of the positions that Vatican II promoted, um, and so the Church had a huge step backs with the papacies of Pope John Paul and Pope Benedict for sure. Uh, and but however everything changed with 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 um, Francis we'll talk about that here in a minute and there are even some Catholics here in America again very very few but there are some here in America that have gone so far since Vatican II in saying that every Pope including John Paul including Benedict since Vatican II every Pope since Vatican II is is illegitimate and thus, they're not the Pope. They're not the true Pope. So they don't have to listen to them. The, the Catholic Church is in is in um, in sin for some of these people. So um, they're very disappointed, and so they see the papacy as permanently remaining vacant. Uh, and so they call themselves here in America sede vacantes, which is Latin for the vacant seat. Uh, and so um, that's how they see it. They are, um, they reject the Pope and they reject the papacy here in, in America. However, from the left, others reacted thinking that the Vatican II didn't go far enough. It was too moderate. It wasn't liberal enough. And that it stopped much of the progressive march that was going on, and particularly with the papacies of Pope John Paul and uh, Pope Benedict had really significantly stopped 
the uh, advances that were to be made or were going to be made because of Vatican II. And so you had many Catholics on the left, you know, joining the civil rights movement, joining the protest movement against Vietnam. You had also many nuns um, on the left because they felt empowered by Vatican II or some of the crap that was going on um, by resisting Vatican II. That You had some nuns here in America who were demanding equal rights, demanding that they should have the same rights and authorities to preside and give the Eucharist and, and do the mass service that a priest or a, you know, a, a monk can do, but why can't a woman do it? And so you had, you know, why couldn't they perform the sacraments or even give last rites? You know, why can't a nun not do that? Here are confessions. Why does it only have to be a male that does it? And so they, here in America specifically, they started around really the 1950s, but it really picked up in the 1970s. Um, coalescing into various uh, groups like the Sisters Formation Conference or the much bigger one, the National uh, Coalition of American Nuns, who still to this day continually lobby against the Catholic Church or the American diocese for equal rights, and they fight for equal rights. And their movement has grown to, especially the Sisters Formation Conference, has become more global uh, but um, here in America, the National Coalition is significantly much bigger. And then you had in 1971, famously, because of Vatican II, uh, particularly uh, um, they, a lot of American priests met in Chicago um, at the American Diocese meetings there, and they famously wrote a letter to, um, to Pope Paul um, there, and they advocated that they petitioned for, allow for, um, the celibacy of the priesthood to be optional, that priests could marry, because it wasn't always church doctrine, that it wasn't church doctrine until the Council of Carthage in 390. And so the, the original church didn't always practice celibacy, that it was always optional. And let us go back to the original church. And this is something that actually Pope Paul, or Pope Francis now, is currently fighting with in... Um, toying with that he's thinking about reversing this so this would be fundamentally huge if this actually happens but now particularly here in the catholic church especially with the papacy of pope paul so this or francis sorry um pope francis um in 2013 so i got the numbers wrong but 2013 many catholics are excited about him and why he's so important is because they see the fulfillment of vatican ii being re rebirthed again because he was a young man and he joined the priesthood by the time Vatican II was starting up. And so he was heavily influenced by the ideas of Vatican II, but never got to see them be acted out. And so a lot of people think this is it. We have a, you know, a Pope who's very sentimental to Vatican II and will actually en enact some of the things. And so of course he created a lot of controversy immediately when Pope Paul, when, when he was in, or Pope Francis, when he was entered, interviewed and asked about his views on homosexuality, I've got the quote here where he said famously, as, pape, as the Pope of the church in which what he says as head of the church becomes church doctrine, he said, if a person is gay and seeks the Lord and is of good will, who am I to judge? You know, and so that's where it opened the door possibly for the Catholic Church to allow and be um, open to the idea of homosexuality within the church. So we'll see. He's never really addressed it ever since since then, um, but there's a lot of hope and expectations around it. So now let's talk about something uncomfortable uh, for the Catholic Church, and let's talk about the sexu sexual um, abuse in the Catholic Church, as well as we're going to talk about um, sexuality within the church as well too specifically um homosexuality but here we're going to talk about the child abuse scandal um, so at the start of the 21st century here in america really after 9 11 shortly after that the american press became aware of systematic decades of systematic child abuse within the Catholic Church and that it was being covered up by the Catholic Church here in America. And so that between uh, 1950 and 2002, uh, studies which were done and shown that around 4% of 
of American Catholic clergy here in America. So around 4,387 were accused of, mis of sexual misconduct with a minor. And that number is around 10,000 little boys and little girls were sexually mo molested between this period. But the tragedy, the inexcusable tragedy of this story is that only, 50, uh, only 252 priests have been convicted of these crimes. And the reason is, is because, again, back to Vatican II, that the church was supposed to have some great, you know, leeway to um, allow the laity to run things and organize things. Both Pope John Paul and Benedict refused. And so allowed the church to continue its practice of running things and thus covering things up. And so we know over 4,000 priests we know we have evidence we have stories we have testimonies we have written documents about these clergy but still only 200 of them have been convicted of their heinous crime so in 2004 um, John Jay College of Criminal Justice released a famous report about which detailed the history and the and um, the patterns of molestation by Catholic priests. And it was foundational because that same study was used throughout the world later on in Australia, um, in parts of the UK, um, and in Brazil, in Argentina as well, that this same report has been used in those countries and to uncover sexual abuse scandals that the Catholic Church had been covering up in those countries as well. So this is why this report is famous. And we do need to talk about it. So what they found was that the child abuse scandal really um, um, had peaks, unfortunately, decades, where it peaked and that it would, you know, lull for a while and the Catholic Church would cover things up, but then neglect some things and then there would be more and more peaks. So from the 1970s and the 1990s is where the bulk of a lot of these cases were done. And what the thing was is that the priests would have a common tactic in which they would call it as grooming tactics, in which they would entice the child to comply with the abuse. And so this was really famously done in the movie uh, that was done a couple of years ago called Spotlight. And so there's a, a famous interview that was done there that kind of highlights this aspect. That Sorry for the commercial. I have what you know. Okay, so, um, where'd you live when it, when it first happened? In the projects, over in Hyde Park. Over by the stop and show. Yeah. yeah. You know it? Yeah, I drove a cab for a few years. Open early, bad coffee, right? Yeah, I guess. How old were you when it happened? I was 12 just after my dad killed himself. Oh, jeez. He was a real piece of shit. You know, my mom, she wasn't so stable either. How do, how do you mean? I mean, she was nuts. She was a schizophrenic. Same shit. When did you first meet Gagan? Well, my sister, she saw him over in the Dunkin' Donuts, tells him about my old man passing, and he rushed right over. And there was this nun, Sister Barbara, and, and she ran this group for kids from troubled families. Mm-hmm. Where was that? Uh, St. Ambrose in Dorchester. Okay. She's the one who introduced me to Father Shanley. He was a street priest. Long hair, very hip. <laughs> he invited me to his apartment in Back Bay. Where in Back Bay? Beacon Street. Beacon, okay. Are you from here? Uh, no, I, I grew up in Ohio, but my mom's from Southie. Oh, yeah, so you got hit. Mm -hmm. I'd never even seen Back Bay. So, what happened on that first visit, Joe? Well, he was very nice at first. Very funny, very casual. And I think he could tell I was gay. So he showed me this mobile he had, like over a baby's crib, mm -hmm. but with different words. Homosexual, transsexual, bisexual. Okay, and did you know you were gay at that time, Joe? 
<laughs> yeah. But that wasn't information I was sharing with anybody. Not in Dorchester. Okay. So, what happened after he showed you the mobile? Well, I was a little freaked out. <laughs> I think he could tell. So he said, you know what'll help is if we play strip poker. Of course I lost. And uh, things went on from there. Can you tell me specifically what happened? Specifically, he, he molested me. Joe, I think that language is gonna be so important here. We can't sanitize this. Just saying molest isn't enough. People need to know what actually happened. We should probably get these to go. <clears throat> So that was just a little example of the movie Spotlight, but also the grooming tactics that you could see. Be, you know, priests befriending troubled kids or just kids in general, having them to their house, showing them something that they're not supposed to see, or as a priest saying, hey, I'm understanding of your situation. Let's play a game, stuff like that. And so these were the common tactics that were often used. Statistically, what happened, what uh, the John Jay College uh, report revealed that only out of all of the cases, only 9% involved what was considered inappropriate touching or inappropriate behavior. So things, you know, over the coat, over the clothes, stuff like that, telling dirty jokes, only 9%. The rest of them are all malicious. And so they gave statistics here. 27% involved some kind of oral sex. 25 involved um, penile in penetration. And while both boys and girls were abused, you know, throughout the report, were very present. There, It was equal opportunist in this abuse. Uh, overwhelmingly, 81% of all cases uh, were involved boys only. Um, but girls were abused as well. And so girls sometimes don't get taught about because of the, um, especially with the movie Spotlight, that it only talks about guys being involved and only highlights guys being involved. But, uh, you know, a significant portion was still girls being sexually molested and raped by uh, priests. So what we've seen like from the movie, if you saw the movie spotlight, but what the report showed that the common practice was, is that typically priests upon learning about the incidents, um, the local Bishop there would typically remove the priest from the church. And they would send them on some kind of medical or psychological treatment for, you know, six months to a year. Uh, and then they were given a bill, you know, clean bill of health and they were reassigned um, uh, to another um, church. And so the church would think it's washed its hand of the deal that we said, hey, you know, we practice forgiveness. We would take them to our treatment centers, which were run by the Catholic Church, were that were not run by doctors, but were run by priests and stuff like that. And so the church thought that they had dealt with the problem, but they really didn't. And they weren't forced to deal with it until, you know, the, you know, things like the Boston Globe, New York Times, Miami Herald, um, and then across, you know, later the Telegraph in London started uncovering these problems. So the media and the local magistrates started to force the church to respond. So it remains still unknown if the papacy ever knew of these incidents and that there was belief that there are secret papers that indicate so, but that the Catholic Church will never acknowledge it or never release it. However, what we do know, we do know of Cardinal Ratzinger and why he's important is because Cardinal Ratzinger later becomes Pope Benedict. And so we know Pope uh, Cardinal Ratzinger was, um, uh, we do know that Cardinal Ratzinger did approach Pope John Paul while he was po Pope about a particular case, this one case that troubled him the most in Mexico with Father um, Daliagos. And that Cardinal Ratzinger was told not to pursue the case, not to deal with it, not to tell local magistrates about it. So to me, this report does show that the papacy knew about it and did cover it up, which again is too appalling.
but we don't have hardcrete evidence. But this is the only evidence that we do have is one report about Cardinal Ratzinger that he told his autobiography uh, that he tried to help but was denied. As a result, um, you have various states here in America and local laws in Boston or um, Baltimore that were passed in these heavy concentrated areas where Catholicism you know, is very concentrated and has significant force that was passed in these local areas in order to force most of these local American dioceses to report these incidents instead of reporting to the government, instead of dealing and instead are reporting it to the Vatican and trying to deal with it internally. And so you see that it, you know, if the if the uh, Vatican II was properly followed, if uh, the Americanist controversy, some of the things that the Americanist controversy wanted to happen, meaning you know that the Catholic Church would be held responsible to local magistrates instead of back to the Vatican City, um, that we might not have had many of these um, abuse scandals. And also the report, um, the John Jay College report also concluded that the Catholic Church was not alone in these same patterns and these same abuse and that these patterns are elsewhere. And so the report famously talked about educational systems, the local educational school system here in America, as well as the Boy Scouts of America, which opened that can of worms. And they also identified several Protestant denominations, and they isolated specifically one denomination in the report, um, the Southern Baptist Convention, which um, the Southern Baptists for a long time denied all this happened, but then eventually in 2017 or 18, I believe, uh, it was finally leaked by the Houston Chronicle that this, the Southern Baptist churches in Texas had been covering up several abuse scandals in Texas for decades. And so the report was right. Um, but again, the, the Southern Baptist Church was denying it. So it's not just the Catholic Church that has this problem. Um, it's a huge problem. And it's almost, it's, it feels like it's an American problem too. But, um, it, you know, the church scandal has gone, you know, elsewhere. Like I say, the UK, Australia, South America. But it was, seems like it was much more prevalent here in America than elsewhere. All right. So now let's talk about sexuality, and we're going to talk about sexuality in the church, more specifically gay rights. So gay and lesbian Americans have really, um, since we have known about their voices, um, meaning you know their voices are being preserved since the 1930s, but more so with the you know, start of the 1950s and 1960s, um, lesbian and gay Americans here in America have continually sought and fought for a public voice and demanded equal acceptance in American society, and more specifically within the church, the Christian church, the Catholic church, the Protestant church, within the church. So for most of Christianity, homosexuality, as well as also within Islam too, uh, has the same issue. Uh, Judaism, uh, it's, it's hit or miss with Judaism. I know Orthodox Jews do see homosexuality as a sin, Conservative Jews, it depends on who you ask, and typically all Reformed Jews and Reconstructive Jews um, see homosexuality as welcoming. Um, but again, Christianity and to some extent Islam has consistently viewed homosexuality as a sinful act, as a sinful sexual act, more specifically, and not related to uh, charges of the procreations by couples. So again, they'll, they'll constantly point to passages like Genesis chapter 2, where God says, be fruitful and multiply, or, or no, that's chapter 1, chapter 2, where God says, um, you, know, um, you know, after he created man, that this is, you know, a woman, that the nature of things is a man is going to leave his, 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 his family and cleave to his wife and his wife's family, and then the two fleshes are to become one, that this is a holy sacrimony. This is the first references to marriage, and it's man and woman, not man and man, or woman and woman. And so they would say that this is the reason is because of procreation, because of Genesis 1, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. This is God's very first commandment to humanity. And yet for homosexuals, they are, you know, naturally they cannot have a child through normal acts of procreation. And so it's always seen as a very sexual sin and sexual act. And so typically 
for Christians and even in Muslims, it's the biblical stories, the Quranic stories of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis and, and also in various surahs within the Quran as well that are often associated with homosexual behavior. So things like sodomy and debauchery and deplorialism, and this is how God responds to sodomy. The term sodomy comes from the, this, this story, Sodom, the city of Sodom. And so these ideas that are often associated with homosexuality often get associated with the biblical story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And if you don't know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, very briefly, it's the story of um, uh, Abraham's uh, uh, his nephew. Yeah, Abraham's nephew, Lot, lives in one of these cities. And God wants, you know, comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I'm going to destroy these cities because they're full of wickedness. And the specific weakness, wickedness that he points out to is later in the story of homosexuality, of homosexual behaviors. This is why they're wicked. I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to rain fire upon them. There's not a righteous person ever. And so, you know, Abraham reasons with God and says, God, you know, there, you know, if I can find just one righteous person, will you not destroy the city? And he said, well, okay, if you can find one person, I'm not going to destroy the city until you get him out of there. And so eventually, this, you know, that's where the story of Lot comes about. And Lot is the one righteous person that's there with his three daughters. And an angel comes to visit him uh, and to warn him about the upcoming destruction. But however, the townspeople heard about it. And so instead, they you know, rush the door and start banging on the door and, and begging him. Uh, begging Lot if they could have this man and take him out and have sex with him and rape this man that they is later revealed to be an angel. And so Lot protects the angel and says, no, no. And then the angel confirms that this is why God's destroying Sodom is because of this type of behavior. And so he famously destroys Sodom and Gomorrah and it's no more in human history. And so this is the punishment for all of the homosexual acts. So that kind of story is often, you know, associated with homosexuality within the church. And so this is why you see things in signs like this. God hates fags. God, fags are worthy of death because of these stories that are found in the Bible and other also within other Quranic texts within the surah that are around the, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. But however, starting in the 1960s, things change. And, and more importantly, starting in 1968, uh, a, a, a preacher uh, out in uh, California and Los Angeles, uh, Tory Perry, uh, founded a community church, the Metropolitan Community Church, f for the sole purpose of being a welcoming church and a welcoming community for homosexuals for people who identify as LGBT. However, Perry and his church were immediately ostracized by the Methodist church and were told that they would be, their licensees would be pulled and thus with that the church, the Methodist church would take ownership of the church and kick the community outside of their church and sue them for ownership because they're breaking covenants, they're breaking rules and agreements and they're teaching heresy so instead what perry decides to do was well i'm going to find my own denomination within christianity because he realized that there's not a single at this time in 1968 there was not a single denomination within christianity that was affirmative and open to homosexuals but yet he found out quickly that his church filled overnight with people that were wanting to be part of a church community who believed in God or who were religious, but yet had nowhere to belong. So in turn, he created the Metropolitan Community Denomination for the sole purpose of creating a space for the LGBT community within Protestantism. And it actually grew very quickly in the 1970s, and it's still around today. I think over 120 churches uh, around America identify with this denomination. Uh, but they've also to affiliate with others. And then subsequently, because of that, because you have a space being created for communities, you start seeing um, you know, LGBT activists starting to emerge. And so most famously, the Stonewall Riots in New York City in 1969. And you have, after that, many Protestant churches become to be retroflecting 
and saying, well, maybe our behavior and our stance is not always welcome. We see this community, this community of Americans that are being unfairly persecuted and being denied certain rights and privileges that every other American gets to enjoy um, because of choice, because who they choose to love and who they have fallen in love with. Just like it's me, if I choose to fall in love with a woman, you know, it's acceptable. So instead, what they did was many communities started to open up their doors, traditional Protestant communities. So the first being the Unitarian Universalist Church shortly after Stonewall in 1969. And then you had the Catholic Church in the 1970s starting to you know, fight within the Catholic Church. And so you had splinter groups emerging groups that wanted to form social support groups just for LGBT communities within their denominations. So it was proof that homosexuality, homosexuals do exist in the church, are active members of the church, but they're having to hide who they are. And so if America is supposed to be a place for all religions and all people to be treated and to live in life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness to treat as one, we need to change the way we do church. And so a lot of groups started to emerge and fight. And so unfortunately within the Protestant churches, accepting homosexuality has become a non-negotiable issue for some um, and in violating scripture. So you have various, I mean, countless stories from the 1960s still to this day of local churches fighting other churches or fighting their denominations for control and power. And I think your textbook, Corrigan, mentions several of them. And I remember when I lived in Raleigh, um, you know, there was uh, several churches that were being pulled uh, from the Southern Baptist Convention because they were starting to accept homosexual homosexuals and homosexuals were being um, you know uh, picketed and being derated as lesser than human beings and so you had the SBC disavowing these churches but then in turn what did these churches do they start forming their own denominations and so, for example, within the Baptist churches, so like I say, back in Raleigh, North Carolina, it was famous um, Pulham Memorial Church and the one out in um, Chapel Hill, I always forget its name, were, you know, forerunners within the Baptist community of accepting, you know, homosexuals within their community. But instead, they ended up finding their own denomination because they were just never accepted. But however, among the Episcopal Church, their fighting uh, produced acceptance eventually. And so you had um, among the Episcopal churches, they started fighting in the 1960s, but eventually in 1976, the Episcopal churches in America started to accept homosexuals. And they appointed their first ever gay, openly gay clergy mem uh, uh, member, it was a, um, a woman, in 1977. But however, since 1977, many conservative ep Episcopals began fighting. And so most famously, by 2009, many of the conservative Episcopals event, you know, eventually broke away with the Episcopal Church in America and formed their own denomination here in America, known as the Anglican Church of America, which is not to be confused with the Anglican Church that is England. But again, it's very confusing. Um, but you can see this is how churches have responded in Protestantism. Churches in Protestantism are just breaking up, are dividing more so because, again, of issues like homosexuality being non-negotiable. And so this becomes the American practice within religion of if you don't like it, leave and start something else. And so that becomes a common practice. So now let's talk about what I call the third wave of new religious movements here in America. So very briefly... Um, we're going to do a little bit of a summary here and talk about what are new religious movements. So traditionally, new religious movements emerge in America in response to what we call disaffected Protestants. So we saw that within the Mormon Church, within Seventh-day Advent, not Seventh-day Adventists, but Jehovah's Witnesses that we talked about, um, the Oneida community, Pentecostalism, Christian Scientist Movement, the Theophysy Society. Um, so we've seen these movements. Or they were aimed at being rest restorative movements of the Christian church. However, starting in the 1960s, we see something completely different. We see new waves of religious movements, really 1950s, but more so the 1960s because of the countercultural movement. 
And so many of these new religious movements that emerge starting in the 1950s are countercultural experiences, representing something completely different and completely different to traditional religion, traditional thought, and, and stay on the outskirts and stay on the fringes of society. And they're often uh, predict or predicated on the leadership of a singular, singular figure. And so the three that we're going to talk about all have this kind of singular leadership figurehead. And they develop some kind of personality cult that the reason that you're part of this membership is because of the leader and the cult-like following that's around him and that person. Uh, but also, too, these movements typically do not survive past the death of the figure. But yet there are some exceptions. And so we're going to talk about one of them being Scientology. And then um, next class, we're going to talk about the other being um, the Harry Christianist movement. But there's also some others that have survived their leadership. But typically, most of them do not survive the initial passage of leadership. Either when he dies, the movement dies, or it might go to the next leader, but then it eventually dies away as well. So this is one that we're going to talk about, this common thread between them. And also a common feature among these groups evolves around joining as a big issue and issues of retention within the group. So typically people join these groups um, and they do so under the belief that they're gaining some kind of benefit. That why I'm joining this group is because it's either going to improve my life, improve my health, improve my social standing. Um, so it's not for religious reasons, not so much for salvation reasons, but it's more for, um, you know, the physical, the secular, um, things here and now, the transient parts of life that we really want here and now. So this is something different. Or also sometimes it's also just mainly a search for community, people that are often um, disassociated with, disenfranchised by society or by your community or by others. And then you find a community among these misfit toys. And we'll really see that with the People's Temple Movement. Um, you know, so you have these, again, something different. But also the most common explanation as to why people join these groups is that they say that they've been brainwashed. And what I mean by brainwash is that, you know, individuals are convinced because of teaching and psychological and emotional uh, manipulation uh, to reject their own rationales, their own systems. And they exchange this for the group's belief and the group system of way and cosmology and systems of thought. Things that sound completely ridiculous to me and you. And so like when we're going to talk about Scientology or when we talk about Heaven's Gate community, you're going to say this is completely crazy. Well, this is how the group succeeds is that they're able to brainwash you or sometimes referred to as deprogram you to get you to, you know, realize that I'm going to reject my own national you know, rationale, my own system of thoughts, my own system of beliefs. And I'm willing to accept this nonsense. And the reason I'm willing to is because I'm going to gain something, some kind of benefit or relief or I'm, because I'm so desperate that I'm searching for some kind of community to belong to. And so this is where brainwashing and deprogramming helps even more. But there's also another thing, threat, why people stay within this group. And it's very hard for them to leave this group and leave this cult is because leaving the group is non-negotiable, usually. And it's usually followed by psychological and, and or physical and emotional abuse to retain membership. And so the temples movement, people, the uh, people's temple movement with Jim Jones involves psychological and physical and emotional abuse. Scientology is is recorded and has been documented of several instances of psychological, physical and emotional abuse. So it's common threads within them. And so because of that, because of these new different trends that we see versus you know, Mormonism versus Jehovah's Witnesses and Pentecostalism, why they don't get associated as being a cult, even though they're a new religious movement. It's because, you know, things like Scientology, Hare Krishna, and um, uh, the People's Temple Movement and all that, they get associated with referring to as cults is because of these other issues, personality cults, um, you know, being brainwashed, 
you know, not focusing on salvation or religious things, but focusing on temporal and secular things. So like I said, this is a clear difference. All right. So let's talk about Jim Jones um, and the People's Temple Movement. So the People's Temple uh, uh, Movement, or sometimes referred to as the as what their church was called, the People's Temple of the Disciples of Christ, uh, was a an, was an American religious movement that was founded by a you know charismatic preacher uh, named Jim Jones in 1955. And Jones, um, in famously in an interview done by, um, I think, Newsweek, he admitted that even though he's preaching at this kind of Christian church and, and is this ordained religious leader, that he admitted publicly and on tele, uh, and well, not on television, but it was written down, but publicly, that he was an atheist, that he didn't believe in religion, but was merely using the religion of Christianity to spread his own message which his own message was a blend of communism as well as with, Christ, with social Christianity. And he was adamant about racial integration. And so he would often refer to it, as, instead of saying social Christianity, he would refer to it as apostolic of socialism. And so that's what he would call his brand of teaching, his brand of philosophy. So prior to him establishing the People's Temple, what we do know of Jones is that Jones first became a Methodist minister in 1952 in um, Indiana, particularly Indianapolis, where he was a popular student um, pastor there in Indianapolis and that he had a huge following um, from a lot of people at the local university there in Indianapolis. Uh, But however, he started inviting not, you know, it was probably at a white church, a white Methodist church. He began to start inviting African American students to his church and to his little groups that he was having at. And so the, the church had a huge, huge problem with it. And so, despite his popularity within the community and within the the, the congregation, uh, he was asked to leave by the leadership over issue of race. They actually told him the reason that we don't want you there is because you you, you brought in black kids to our church and we don't want black kids here. So in turn, what Jones decided to do because of that and realized that racism is such a huge problem that instead he founded his own church and he began using fake healing services because at first when he found his own church, it wasn't successful, but then he started watching famous uh, Pentecostal ministers going to Pentecostal services um, in Ohio or in, in Kentucky And he would see how they would draw big crowds. And so he would take some of the elements of Pentecostalism and he would bring it about. So he have fake healing services and he also do fake, you know, clairvoyance tests or clairvoyance tricks. And so what that was, was so, for example, we do know about this because it was leaked um, that he would hire private investigators to go and investigate people instead of people just coming to his church services they had to register and buy a ticket through the mail so they had to have their name had to have their address and so these private investigators would take that information and go and research about these individuals and so and then they he would have a secondary system that once at the service um, he would have his workers confirm if so say if i'm you know Miss Billy Jones is who I'm, I interviewed and wanted to impress. So Miss Billy Jones, I had my private eye go out and investigate and learn all her information, where she lives, what color is her car, um, you know, what's the name of her dog, um, if she has any children, if she's had been to the hospital here recently, stuff like that. And then he would have his co-workers confirm on a sheet that up oh, here's mrs billy jones she's here and so they would mark it and so they would let jones know that this person was here and where she was sitting and so of course when he's up on stage uh preaching and he would stop and he would use this moment of fake clairvoyance that he's how did i ever met this woman i know you you're miss billy jones you live at uh you know 1402 south gay avenue you know you've got a dog named spunky I know exactly who you are. You drive a Ford Falcon. You know, you went to this school. You you had surgery just recently on your gallbladder. Are you okay? 
I, you know, I'm going to pray right now for God to heal you. And so everybody was just amazed at this person and he attracted so much attention and he would trick people to join them because again, he went to Pentecostal services and this is what they taught him to do as well. However, what is forgotten about Jones and largely still because of the tragedy that would happen in 78, but what's forgotten about Jones was Jones was a strong civil rights leader in Indiana and then later in the city of San Francisco. He was quite very successful in integrating various parts of Indianapolis, the fire department, uh, the electric company in Indianapolis, uh, the hospital, the, uh, the university hospital there in Indianapolis. And his church, he was, you know, um, he created various social welfare programs within his church. So soup kitchens um, where people would come eat free, free soup every day, free meals, job placements, which was something very new that he would have job trainings and have people come to his church to perform interviews for people who were interested in jobs and also free job training that, you know, certain basic skills that you can do um, that you could work at. He would host workshops and he would have people, you know, be able to get off the streets by giving them a skill and a job. And then also he was uh, foundational for actually establishing free clothing um, places at a lot of churches that people that a lot of churches copy now of giving away free clothing or clothes for jobs, new jobs. This was some of the ideas that he had. So he was very famous and was beloved for his acts. So much so that um, he actually was a part of Jimmy Carter's 1976 presidential nomination uh, or um, inauguration when he was, you know, President Carter was sworn into oath. Jim Jones was there because he was a beloved and popular figure in America. And so, again, he was a civil rights leader. He mar he didn't march with Dr. King, but he was advocately a civil rights leader. And so he also was very successful because of his message. He had a very elegantian style message, and he often preached in his sermons about social justice, about racial equality, about community, and that he was quite appealing. Um, and it was significant is because as a white man, and you know his congregations were predominantly African American. Nearly 65% at its height was African American at his churches. However, things started to change for Jones starting in the 1960s. Uh, one, he started preaching. We, we started noticing in the 1960s because he had voice recordings of all his sermons that he started preaching kind of what we call us versus them sermons. Who are, you know, it's us constantly versus them. They're always after us. They're always fighting us. The world is constantly after us. They're going to kill us. They're coming to bomb us. Every stuff like that. It's always us versus them kind of messages. And he also started to equate the truth, that equating Jesus and the message of the Gospels as being that of communism, that Jesus was a socialist, that the Gospels were actually a socialist doctrine, and that the true evil that the book of Revelation and that the true Satan was capitalism and the American system that was neglecting and failing his congregations that, again, was predominantly African-American in the 1960s that were being, you know, persecuted and being, you know, being bullied. And he was saying, see, the American system is not truly just. It is the communist state. It's communism that is much fair. And so he also encouraged members to be paranoid about infiltration. So people coming to these church services who don't normally join here, that you need to be suspicious of them and that you know, any stranger that comes into our church, that they have an alternative agenda to destroy his community. And so it created, again, an us versus them mentality within his community. But however, famously in 1961, uh, he famously had a vision of a nuclear holocaust that would happen in Chicago and in the Indianapolis area, that a nuclear bomb would be blown off in the area and destroy everybody. So he began to actively search for new and safe locations for his religious community. And eventually he settled on a small town in Northern California called Ayuka. Um, California, and he actually moved the community in 1965, um, significant portion of them, you know, only 140 uh, people 
wanted to move but so now he's got multiple communities those in Indianapolis that stay there and now he's starting a new community in California however Northern California really didn't suit him very well so instead um, by 1970 he had moved um, again his community to um, San Francisco and then later to LA but he he primarily stayed in San Francisco that was his home base but he established churches so at that time he had four churches he had a church in Indianapolis a church in Yucca uh, one in San Francisco that became the home church and then also one in, in LA and then at one point in those four churches he had 500 members in those churches and he would fly routinely to those areas or drive to those areas or you know, take trains to those areas to do sermons and stuff. So he had a big following. Um, however, it was in California that J Jones really grew bolder in his claims and started to reject the Bible as, quote, white man's justification to dominate women and to enslave other races and claimed that he was the incarnate of Jesus Christ as well as the living incarnation of the Buddha, of Gandhi, and of course, because he's a socialist, Vladimir, you know, Vladimir Lenin. Additionally, Jones also claimed to be a national celebrity, or, he, or additionally, Jones became a national celebrity, like I already mentioned, that governors wanted to meet him, wanted to consult with him, senators constantly wanted to meet and consult with him. Again, Jimmy Carter, uh, you know, uh, ha invited uh, Jim Jones to the White House and he also started to forge alliances with a lot of media outlets and would use them to help him gain influence or to paint a positive picture of himself and he used that subsequently to make his way into city council in San Francisco and was a prominent member of the San Francisco community and the city government for a while. And then in 1977, Jones and several of his followers all of a sudden abruptly left the San Francisco area and decided to establish a community in um, Guyana, uh, which is in South America, if you've never heard of it. It's in South America on the northern parts of, you know, above Brazil, um, just south of Colombia, um, but on the northern portions of South America. And um, because, and then it was found out the reason why he left is because soon a publication came out of, of an expose that Marshall Cudliff did, in which it, there were several allegations uh, made by a lot of former members of the People's Temple of physical abuse and emotional abuse and even sexual abuse performed by Jones and performed by several members of the temple. And so now you start having police investigations and political investigations being done on Jones and his community. And so thus, it turned out to be that Jones fled to Guyana because Guyana was a place of no um, criminal extraction that they wouldn't extract prisoners to the United States from. So in Guyana, Jones instead established a model communist community in which he uh, later referred to it as Jonestown, of course, named it after himself. And he started preaching that, that, that this community and his followers would translate, as the word was, uh, to the next world, that they would die together as a pure communist community and that they would go on to live on another planet. So again, jo Jones's ideas are just becoming wild at this point. But by the fall of 1977, uh, political pressure was really mounting in Washington and in California to investigate Jones and his communities for the a lot of the atrocities that were being done by him, that had been done by him, and a lot of the criminal, criminal behavior that he had done um, as well. So, um, so you have eventually in, in November of 1978, uh, California Congressman Leo Ryan famously led a fact-finding mission from Congress from DC to Jonestown in order to investigate the rumors of all the human rights violation that was being done by by Jim Jones and his community and um, and uh, Congressman Leo also brought a TV crew with him an NBC TV crew with him and on November uh, the 18th Jones actually entertained the group 
and attempted to demonstrate that much of these problems were false. All these accusations were false. Everything was fine. Jones is this amazing person. It's just, you know, rumors. Come on, man. But however, during this time, Jones had secretly become very suspicious of what was going on and actually was very paranoid at this time. And then later was found out that he was um, heavily abusing drugs at this time, too. Um, and so he has sanctioned a, an assassination attempt to be done on Leo Ryan because he was so fearful of what was going on and so paranoid. Uh, but however, the, the assassination attempt failed. And so you had the next day, Ryan and the, the NBC crew are fleeing the community, fleeing for their lives. But at the same time, out of the community, about 15 people said, take us with us, take us with you. And so they smuggle the 15 people out of the community and they make their way to the airport. But however, by the time they're at the airport waiting for their airplane, um, Jones had sent a community, uh, sent some of his um, members there with guns and they shot and killed uh, Congressman Ryan as well as, um, yeah, uh, several others. It's even a guy that was reporting live on NBC, um, you know, not well not live but he had a tape that was being recorded but yeah uh, he was sh shot he survived but you see the gunman and everything coming out and shooting and he gets hit you know um everything so it was a very brutal thing uh later that day um jones grabbed his people and said that um the game is up and jones uh led over 900 members and out of the 900 300 of them were children in a massive suicide temp. And, um, and the, the event, the actual, what was going on was actually recorded live. And so we have those tapes. And so Jones recorded everything. And in that recording, you can hear him talk about that he's fearful and he's telling the people that you need to commit suicide because the United States government is sending paratroopers down and they're coming any minute now to come kill us and take your babies away. And that the Soviet Union could not come. They could not come and rescue you. And so the only way to start a revolution is to commit suicide. And I wanted to play a little bit of that tape for you because um, it's, it's just ghostly eerie listening to this. How very much I've loved you. How very much I've tried my best to give you the good life. But in spite of all of that I've tried, a handful of our people with their lives have made our life impossible. There's no way to detach ourselves from what's happened today. Not only we're in a compound situation, not only are there those who have left and committed the betrayal of the century, some have stolen children from others and they're in pursuit right now to kill them because they stole their children. And we, we are sitting here waiting on a powder keg. I don't think this is what we want to do with our babies. I don't think that's what we had in mind to do with our babies. It was said by the greatest of prophets from time immemorial, no man lay, takes my life from me, I lay my life down. So to, to sit here and wait for the catastrophe that's going to happen on that airplane, it's going to be a catastrophe. It almost happened here. Almost happened. The congressman was nearly killed here. But you can't steal people's children. You can't take off with people's children without expecting a violent reaction. And that's not so unfamiliar to us either. If we, even if we were Judeo-Christian, if we weren't communists, the world, the kingdom, suffers violence, and the violence shall take it by force. If we can't live in peace, then let's die in peace. We've been so betrayed. We have been so terribly betrayed. 
But we tried, and this Jack Beam often said, I don't know where he's at right this moment, where's Jack? He said, if this only worked one day, it was worthwhile. Yeah. What's going to happen here in a matter of a few minutes is that one of those people on that plane is going to, going to shoot the pilot. I know that. I didn't plan it, but I know it's going to happen. They're going to shoot that pilot, and down comes that plane into the jungle. And we had better not have any of our children left when it's over, because they'll parachute in here on us. I'm telling you, just as plain as I know how to tell you, I've never lied to you. I never have lied to you. I know that's what's going to happen. That's what he intends to do. And he will do it. He'll do it. Fortunately, being so bewildered with many, many pressures on my brain, seeing all these people behave so treasonous, it was just too much for me to put together. But uh, uh, I now know what he was telling me, and it'll happen. If the plane gets in the air, even. <coughs> so my opinion is that we be kind to children and be kind to seniors and take the portion like they used to take in ancient Greece and step over quietly because we are not committing suicide. It's a revolutionary act. We can't go back. They won't leave us alone. They're now going back to tell more lies, which means more congressmen. And there's no way, no way we can survive. Mm. All right. So I just wanted to show you a little bit of some of his clips. Like I said, it's 30 minutes, oh, almost 40 minutes long. And you can hear the people cheering, people cheering about committing suicide. And you keep hearing them say over and over again, the reason why we're doing it is to protect our children. We're not letting our children be taken from us. And they're coming for us, this type of language. And then you'll get to a point later on in the tape, there's people arguing back and forth. There's clearly some members of the community that don't want to do it. Um, and Jones convinces them um, about doing it. And then later on, towards the end you hear you know children screaming and Jones saying they're not in pain they're not in pain it's just bitter they're screaming because it's bitter the poison's not hurting them it's just bitter just be quiet you know parents hush your babies be quiet you know and you hear people dying on the radio um, and so uh, Leslie said this was the tragic act of Jonestown and so this is some live images from the following day of just masses amount of people had to commit suicide drinking a mixture of cyanide poison with kool-aid but however jones himself uh, i think he died from overdose um i don't think he i don't think he shot himself some people said he shot himself but he could have i'm not sure now um but i think he he, he didn't drink the kool-aid but he actually um died of drug overdose as well as i think maybe gunshot too but i'm not sure all right, so that's at least Jim Jones. Let's talk about another uh, of these new religious movements groups. And so we're going to talk about Heaven's Gate. So I remember Heaven's Gate you know, very well because it happened during my lifetime. It happened while I was in um, middle school uh, when it happened. And so I do remember it very, you know, very, uh, um, very real that I remember. And I remember uh, some of these characters. I remember T and Doe for sure. Uh, but Heaven's Gates was an, an American religious movement that centered around secret knowledge that people had. Also, millennial expectations that the end is coming, the end is near, as well as UFOs. So sometimes um, Heaven's Gates gets referred to as a UFO religion uh, because later as we'll talk about the belief that there was a UFO at the trail end of a comet. And that I mean, once you, if you, the only way to have your soul escape your body was to commit suicide and have it be attached to a UFO. And we'll talk more about that. But the group was founded by a couple, <coughs> excuse me, Marshall Applewhite and Bonnie Nettles in 1974, that they were both, um, uh, they were both nurses, if I remember right. Um, uh, nurses at a hospital in Houston, Texas, and they both met each other uh, and they were both fascinated as a couple, but also fascinated at some other things about themselves. So they were both fascinated about biblical prophecy. 
very fascinated about eschatology, which is Greek for study of last things, so study of the end time, as well as Eastern philosophy and a lot of scientific science fiction novels. And so that's how they kind of bonded as a couple. And as a couple, they began, they quit their jobs as nurses and they started to become a revivalist team, singing and preaching their unique message uh, that they started touring East Texas as an evangelist team. And they both preached that they were the two witnesses that are spoken of in the book of Revelations as signs of Christ coming back from again, that there's these two witnesses that first have to appear before Christ comes back and that it's them. And they went on to preach in their message that in their, in their teachings that they both would be killed, but then brought back to life and taken up to a spaceship. So of course, People in Texas thought these cu this couple was absolutely nuts and pretty much drove them out of town and drove them out of Texas. And eventually, uh, both Applewhite and Nettles um, started to look for, you know, they were kind of disappointed that their, you know, religious ideologies didn't take root. And so they started to find followers among those who believed in conspiracy theories and in UFO sightings and people who claimed that they had been abducted. And so they would go to some of these meeting groups or these um, talks or meeting people, you know, these books and these newspapers, stuff like that. And they started to find memberships around then and also catering their religious beliefs around these people. And so among their followers, Applewhite and Nettles started to claim that they, in fact, were aliens and and called themselves the ufo 2 so now they're switching from biblical stuff to now ufo religion and that they came to earth to look for participants in their alien experiments and in exchange uh, those who were willing to be ex ex uh, experiment on uh, their followers would be assisted into what they would say evolving to a higher level of life and so they were passing on secret knowledge to these individuals and so this is how they got some of their people uh, they taught that the bible and all religions were referring to aliens instead of gods and angels and demons and that they were the good aliens who created the world and that the humans had become um and 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 and, and humans but bad aliens called luciferinians which is a play on lucifer from the bible and from christian traditions and jewish traditions Lucifer, who corrupted the world, these bad aliens. So these are the good aliens that are coming to preach the good message, the good news. And so believe in them. And eventually they believed in this kind of millennial expectation that was popular, you know, that pulled in some episodes of uh, environmentalism. That eventually the world, instead of being consumed by fire, would instead be recycled and cleansed by fire. In the year 2027, so we're not that far off, folks. So, you know, make, make sure your ducks in are in a row. Uh, but the only chance for humans to survive was that they had to escape this world uh, before they died, um, their souls to be able to escape the human body and transition to the next level. And so they had this next level, this secret knowledge of how to transition to the next level. And eventually they had a small group of followers, no more than 200 people. But um, in 1975, uh, at, in Waldport, uh, Oregon, both Applewhite and Nettles and a few group of, of, of believers stole uh, the public's attention for a night and that they had publicly disappeared in front of everybody's eyes. They were on top of a, of a hotel there in Waldport and they just magically vanished into thin air and it actually made the evening news cbs evening news that night and so everybody was kind of curious um however the reality was is that the couple actually didn't disappear but instead went underground and changed the way they looked changed their names changed their appearances and they started traveling um um uh, around instead of preaching in one spot there in the west coast there in oregon and they were traveling to avoid detection and they were traveling, living among homeless groups, um, living in um, halfway houses in order to reach people and reach people to believe in them. And they had various different names 
um, that they would go by. And one of the most popular names that they would go by was T and Doe. And so I do remember them and they would have TV commercials as T and Doe and sing little songs um, when I was a kid. I, I vaguely remember them. Um, and that they were living under these various aliases while recruiting members. And so um, their most popular member of the Heaven's Gate group was actually a current U.S. congressman in the 1970s, and John Craig, uh, who uh, converted to believing in this strange group's um, beliefs and systems. And like I said, they actually used to write comic books and stuff, and so I remember those. Uh, but eventually, uh, it was not until the death of Nettles in, in, in 1985 uh, that the group reemerged out of, you know, from reemerged to the public. And it did also, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, Applewhite did a little bit of rebranding of the group. And so it actually became listed as kind of a business group, a self-help group uh, that had tracks and had publications and had books you can buy at a bookstore. Um, and it was all this business that they ran instead of a religious group known as Higher Sources. And they actually had a website for a very long time, too. Um, but after Nettle's death, it became apparent to Applewhite that changes in the group's beliefs um, needed to merge because uh, Nettles didn't go to the next level. She died. She died of cancer, I think, too. I remember that. So. Applewhite changed the group's beliefs from instead of a physical dis departure from life, that your consciousness actually departs from life um, instead. Um, and it was famously, um, the group kind of remained quiet for a very long time, and you didn't hear from them much except the old cartoons that they would put on and the old um, uh, comic book strips that they would have. I, I vaguely remember, but I do remember... Um, famous uh, Art Bell's famous radio station that doesn't exist hardly anymore, but Coast to Coast Radio, they would come in on 2 or 3 in the morning, and, and he was out of Los Angeles in AM radio, and he would do all conspiracy theor theories and interview weird people and have alien sightings and all this stuff. But very famously, he, uh, he interviewed um, uh, Doe. He interviewed Applewhite. And had him come on his show because he was talking about the famous um, Haley Bob Comet that came through in 1996. And um, the group there, um, the Higher Sources group, revealed that they had a theory that um, prior to this, that there was an object that was accompanying them, that it was this, uh, that was something was uh, that something was behind the comet, and that you could see it, and it was actually a UFO. And the UFO was coming to Earth because the comet was going to come by and pass by Earth and you were going to be able to see it for a couple of days. And so it, uh, later on, it was actually scientists confirmed later on that year that something actually was trailing the comet. Um, and so this was something that he kind of predicted in a way. And so a lot of people became interested in this group all of a sudden because he predicted something that scientists later confirmed that something was there. And so scientists believed actually is a piece of the comet that had been broken off, but it was traveling with it. So you can see here a picture. And I remember it didn't really look like this so much, but you could see that something, there was something protruding it, that the comet was passing this way, but something else was here um, back there. And so it was this belief that the comet was there. However, um, Applewhite and his followers in October, uh, mysteriously started to rent this massive mansion outside the suburbs of San Diego and be began recruiting members to live with them and to prepare for the common. So they had about, I think, 70 people ultimately came and lived with, with them all together in this massive mansion that they all had rented. Uh, and eventually in, in March of uh, uh, 1997, Applewhite made a video called Dew's Final Exit, in which he spoke of suicide as, quote, the only way to evacuate the Earth as the spaceship was coming to, to take them to Heaven's Gates. And so this is where the term Heaven's Gates comes to refer to the group. And so I remember watching it live on television. Um, you know, news stations were broadcasting it because they thought this guy was an idiot. So I wanted to show you actually one of those broadcasts. 
What do you love most? Of course not. Peanut yeah. butter, chocolate. We got you, dog. We got you. I'll tell you who I am. As to whether or not you believe who I am or not is up to you. I'm from kingdom level above human. What does that yield? That yields immediately that the vast majority say, cult, some religious radical, some blasphemous individual that wants to take advantage of people, you know, has some big bank account somewhere that they're taking whatever possessions that followers can get. I wish you'd show me where that bank account so that we could use it to get this information out. Everyone's quick to condemn. I mean, they don't even look see anymore. They just see a tiny little aspect of someone else and they quickly determine that they're so brilliant that they can judge it as being not what they're looking for, worthless, some radical movement, some uh, movement that certainly is beneath them. I'll tell you about a kingdom level beyond here, and if you want to go there, then you have to follow me because I'm the guy who's got the key at the moment. And it requires that you, if you move into that evolutionary kingdom, that you leave behind everything of human ways, human behavior, human ignorance, human misinformation. Now, breaking away from the world is not easy. It's difficult. It's tough. And breaking away doesn't mean that, you know, I'm, I'm going to go live in some place with this little cult and I'll, you know, sp spend time on weekends or at least on holidays with the family that I left because they're my No. It means that you leave that world behind. You even become another individual. It means that even the mind that you had as a human is aborted and the soul that was given to you is filled with next level information, next level mind, and a new creature is born. Most renditions of human artists of extraterrestrials are the most grotesque things that you can possibly imagine. Look like some praying mantis or some insect that has some crazy shape or form, and that's ridiculous. They are perfectly beautiful suits of clothes. They are perfectly beautiful bodies, neither male nor female. They don't need to have hair that needs to be cut. They don't need to have curlers. They don't need to use makeup. They, it's a, it's a body that exists, except when it has to go to a place like planet Earth. It's a body that exists, for the most part, in a non-destructive environment. So it's potentially an eternal body, a everlasting body. This is your chance. I'm here. I can take you out of here. I can lead you into that kingdom level above human. That can't happen unless you leave the human world that you're in and come and follow me. Time is short. Last chance. Yeah. And so eventually Applewhite and so 30 other members uh, performs a, a massive suicide between the day between March 22nd and 26th. And so what they did was that they would take turns um, killing themselves and that the other members had to prepare the bodies correctly. So this is actually pictures when the police found the apart found the uh, mansion that these are dead bodies that were laid perfectly well uh, after the committing suicide in these bunk beds in which people lived on. Uh, and so, um, you know, they all massively committed suicide after the comet had passed, believing that their souls would escape the body, be transported to the comet, and the comet would take them and take them to Heaven's Gate. Um, and so, uh, you know, all 39 victims that were found were found in these matching Nike outfits, which this is just a funny story. Um, and like I said, they were placed, um, and the reason they only had Nike outfits is, and no lie, this is actually true, um, because there was one survivor uh, of the group and that who had bought the stuff, but he didn't go through with it. Um, the only reason everybody had matching Nike outfits is because um, it was on sale. 
that's that's the truth that they were looking for i think shoes and there was a deal if they bought the amount of these shoes they would get this price off and free clothing for free and so everybody bought nike apparel in you know and so all of them died and so i remember in 97 that nike had to instantly put out a, a you know a, a press release saying we're not related to these guys we're not you know whatever but it was just interesting that it was you know a funny true story that the only reason they're having to wear this stuff is it was all on sale um, but yeah, that they, they were found neatly on the beds, um, with a purple cloth over their bodies and also inside their pockets was $5 and 75 cents. And the reason that they had $5 and 75 cents was it was to pay a fee. Uh, I think it was like a trespassing fee collectively that all of them had, or there was some kind of other fee, uh, about transporting the bodies or something like that. And so all of them had, you know, five dollars and seventy-five cents on them. And then later on, on how the police found out about everything was uh, the next day, on March twenty-six, various media outlets across California as well as across the world or in America received a strange package from Apple White that contained a video, and it was his last message. Um, and that's how the police and the media found out about the massive suicide. But however, following the coverage of these groups on TV, like I said, I remember watching it on television, watching um, his speech and um, his message, and everybody thought this was stupid. However, 58 other copycat suicides occurred shortly after the videos were aired and news reports were aired during this time. So it was, you know, no one doesn't know if this was related to the Heaven's Gates movement or if this was just simply copycat people. Um, today, there are two anonymous members that we don't know who they are, but they do tell a lot of stories about the group and who have written bibliographies. Um, and that did survive the, the story and did survive to tell the tale of the cult group. And they also do maintain the group's website. So you can actually still search it, uh, the website they have, and it's still maintained. And it's maintained in old, you know, Windows 96, you know, software. So it looks very, very old, but it's still maintained as a uh, thing of prosperity. All right. So the last group that we I want to talk about is uh, I want to talk about Scientology as another example of a new religious mo movement group that has a founder in religion, but however has survived past its founder. So one so Scientology is one of the hotly debated issues, and not only in religion but also here in America as one of these new religious movements groups, because the question is: Is it really a religion? Once you know its history, once you know its origins and what L. Ron Hubbard um, originally created some of the teachings and the beliefs around Scientology, or is it a cult? I mean, a lot of people will be quick to judge that it's a cult, especially here in Florida and out in California where, you know, Scientology does have headquarters here in Tampa as well as out in California. Or is it a medical therapy as Ron Hubbard always proclaimed and held on to? Or was it just basically a huge tax scam? That's always been the debate around this community. Uh, and if, if you don't know, um, Scientology was founded, um, the religion of Scientology was founded by a famous scientific science fiction writer and author, L. Ron Hubbard, who has a fascinating, interesting, weird story. You know, he served in the military, served in the Navy, but however, was kind of discharged because he did crazy and, and, and questionable things like invading Mexico during World War II. Um, but he initially developed a lot of his set of religious ideas based off his own personal struggles. Um, uh, he suffered from depression and suffered from a lot of um, insecurities and drug abuse later that we come to know. But he was really interested and he was a very um, student student when he wanted to be. Uh, he was interested in psychotherapy, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung's theories. Very interested in metaphysical religions. And metaphysical religions is basically religions that um, believe in some kind of divine healing or healing through religious practices or healing through um, um, the mind, so it's not medicine, but it's through metaphysical things. 
Um, and like I said, his own personal struggles and things. He 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 uh, was in therapy after he left the Navy and felt that his own therapy sessions with the Navy weren't successful, and so he thought he could do it better. And so he started researching therapy. But however, within his um, teachings and within his research, he started to promulgate certain things that were kind of questionable about what he believed. There's a lot of doubt if these if if L. Ron Hubbard actually took this thing seriously, because there's there's stories about him when he would go and give lectures and present his beliefs that he would joke a lot and he would laugh a lot about what he believed and what he talked about. Or he would say things kind of off the cuff of his shirt, you know, it's like, is he being serious or is he being jo jovial? We really don't know. Um, but there's some elements of Eastern religion here um, in, in what he talks about. A lot of people associate Scientology with some elements of Hinduism, um, as well as some things about, you know, other science fiction religions like Star Wars that got some influences off Scientology. But however, he believed that, in, that all individuals from psychotherapy, that all individuals suffer from suppressed trauma and su suppressed traumatic events that had occurred in their past. And he called these uh, traumatic events egrams. But through special counseling and special techniques that he called auditing, where basically it's psychoanalysis where you ask a bunch of questions, let somebody investigate and, you know, and, and determine what kind of social ills and social problems or physical problems or past problems a person has. So very much kind of a Freudian approach, but he just re, 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 renames everything that he calls auditing, auditing them in order to spiritually heal somebody. So through counseling, somebody could spiritually be healed by uncovering these past traumatic events. And to aid the counselor, what they would do is use this special device in which Hubbard um, sort of invented with a, with a colleague called an e-meter, which is some kind of medical device that scans your body and, and finds certain areas where um, hot spots on your body in which therapy can be, um, ex you can extract certain social problems or things that you're wearing on your physical person stress and traumatic things that you might not realize is there. Um, he also believed that humans ultimately consist of what he would call the self or a spirit. But for him and Ron Hobbert's theories that he called it a Thean and that the Thean is um, immortal and that it reincarnates itself upon somebody's death and that Theans uh, have lived over billions and trillions of years um, and they've had multiple lifetimes and so you as an individual your soul is somebody else's soul in a sense and that your soul is just merely inhabiting your body at this moment in time and as soon as you die your soul will transgress and go to another person um, and so you, you know your consciousness is all that matters so you're somebody else's consciousness from the past so you're really not your own you're this stay in. And so it reincarnates over many lifetimes and that they're and that Thans are also the source of all creation. So you as an individual, you created this world, you created everything in it, everything that's good within it. Uh, but however, as these kind of creator beings, the reason why we're stuck here on Earth is because we quote unquote fell from grace. Um, because of our arrogance is that because we took too much time and focus on uh, on too much interest on the earthly things that we created instead of focusing on us and thus we have lost our way or as he says it here we've lost quote their memory of their true nature and their true self and so thus you are trapped in this physical body trapped in this physical world and so that's why you need a counselor why you need you know this counseling technique in order to uncover your true self and help you uncover your old memories and and be able to uncover your true identity and help and enable and, and therefore enable you to escape this physical world again and, and physical body again because the whole point of life is to help remember your past life and all this counseling that you do is to remember your past life so that you can uncover your true self um, and not this false one that you are currently living right now.
And however, the bulk of his teachings all come from a primary book, some some other books like Excalibur, but primarily um, this book called Dianetics, The Modern Science of Mental Health. And since then, um, the Dianetics book has really become a canonical book for Scientologists, sort of like the Bible for Scientologists. Um, but real quick, I want to show you a quick video, the last video I want to show you of what South Park did. They did a brief episode on Scientology and their little brief um, tutorial about Scientology uh, was genius. And it shows you just kind of how weird much of his beliefs are and how much they come from the world of science, uh, science fix, fiction literature. Are we the first candy to make something thin? Nah. Are we the best at it? Yep. It all began 75 million years ago. Back then, there was a galactic federation of planets, which was ruled over by the evil Lord Xenu. <laughs> Xenu thought his galaxy was overpopulated, and so he rounded up countless aliens from all different planets, and then had those aliens frozen. Frozen alien bodies were loaded onto Xenu's galactic cruisers, which looked like DC-8s, except with rocket engines. The cruisers then took the frozen alien bodies to our planet, Earth, and dumped them into the volcanoes of Hawaii. The aliens were no longer frozen. They were dead. The souls of those aliens, however, lived on and all floated up towards the sky. But the evil Lord Xenu had prepared for this. Xenu didn't want their souls to return, and so he built giant soul catchers in the sky. The souls were taken to a huge soul brainwashing facility, which Xenu had also built on Earth. There, the souls were forced to watch days of brainwashing material, which tricked them into believing a false reality. Xenu then released the alien souls, which roamed the Earth aimlessly in a fog of confusion. At the dawn of man, the souls finally found bodies which they could grab onto. They attach themselves to all mankind, which still to this day causes all our fears, our confusions, and our problems. Yeah, that's actually what Scientologists believe, so it's kind of quirky and weird. But however, although uh, Hubbard's work was an instant success and very popular, his Dianetic, uh, Dian Dianetics book was a New York Times bestseller, um, it quickly, very, very, very quickly drew the ire and criticism of the medical world and profession. And so most famously, uh, in 1951, uh, Morris Fishbein uh, wrote a famous uh, academic journal article um, in the Journal of Medicine, I believe it was, American Medicine, um, which largely debunked all of Hubbard's claims about medicine, about psychology, about everything that he claimed in his book about Dianetics and he called it famously quack medicine. And this is how he kept referring to science Hubbard's claims, not as a religion, but as medicine. And that's how Hubbard claimed it too. He claimed early on that this wasn't a religion that he was creating, but rather, as he say, modern science for mental health, he would believe that this was medicine that he was talking about and psychoanalysis. And so the medical world largely dismissed Ron Hubbard and his claims. Uh, but not everybody dismissed it fully. In 1951, um, the state of New Jersey there, the New Jersey Board of Medicine Medical Examiners, uh, successfully sued Ron Hubbard uh, and his practices um, of medicine because that's what he was doing. He was practicing medicine in his mind, psychotherapy, um, and with practicing without an official license. And bankrupt uh, Ron Hubbard and his foundation that he established um, of, of psychoanalysis. But however, in order to escape what he did, he decided instead of saying, okay, fine, I'm not a medicine, I'm not a psychoanalysis. Instead, he wrote a famous book called Scientology the next year, 1952, in which he reorganized his techniques and his teaching and his ideas and said, no, 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 no. I'm not creating you know, therapy, psychoanalysis and medicine. I'm doing religious philosophy. And then later on, he's, he changes that to say, I'm doing religion. And so thus, really in 1952, in my mind, with the, his book Scientology, 
the Church of Scientology was born. So very quickly, um, from 1954 to 1960, uh, Ron Hubbard established several churches, what he would call them churches, but they kind of looked like um, therapy sessions. They looked like, you know, your, your local therapist office. Um, throughout America, the United Kingdom and in Ireland, South Africa and Australia, uh, but the founding church for the Church of Scientology was his D Washington, D.C. office for many years. Uh, but however, in 1963, uh, the federal government started to investigate, particularly um, uh, the FBI, but um, here the FDA, Food and Drug Association, uh, began investigating the church and um, even raided the church in, I think, January of 63, um, you know, raided the church's offices and seized hundreds of his e-meters and had the e-meters labeled as illegal medical devices. Um, and so the, to, to possess an e-meter and to use an e-meter on a person was a criminal offense for a very long time until it changed in the 90s. And also the, uh, the federal government also began seizing thousands of church literature that was being passed out to people and being mailed to people and accusing this literature of, quote, making false medical claims. And so um, really from this point on, this Church of Scientology and several national governments, America from 1963 onward to, to, um, till uh, 1993, uh, the UK, um, uh, France for sure, Germany for sure, have always had hostile relationships with the Church of Scientology. Um, and because of that, Hubbard really from 1972 onward uh, was forced to go into hiding uh, because several criminal charges were being laid upon him because of his acts, his behavior of what his, you know, he, of his church, of his religious group, not really being a religious group or considered a religious group, but considered doing medicine. And so um, Ron Hubbard kind of lived the rest of his life um, running from the law. He actually established a, a colony on, um, on boats actually. Uh, the Sea Org, uh, and he was the captain because he served in the U.S. Navy, so he could he, so he could drive a boat. But he he eventually bought a huge boat and had people come and do church services out there on the boat in international waters. That was a, that no you know government can come out and get him, and so he did that all the way up until close to to really close to his death in 1986. Um, however, when uh, Hubbard's after Hubbard died, the leadership of the church passed to his deputy, his second man in command, who still leads the church to this day, David Miskovich, and uh, who sought to, David has really tried to make the church into a denomination. And that's really how it's looked today, that he's kind of, he's the one that's made the Scientology more looking and acting and behaving like a church. Um, they have missionary groups, they have literature, they have door-to-door -door witnesses, they have missionary training and training schools and people, um, they have church services in such a way. And so it's really him who's kind of made it more and more like a religion. And David is really popular within the church, the Scientology church, because he was successful from 1991 all the way up to 1993 in negotiating with the U.S. government to have the U.S. government now officially recognize Scientology as a recognized and legal religion here in America. So David is very much looked up, you know, looked upon. He's sometimes referred to as a COB a lot of times, the chairman of the board. Um, and he's kind of, he, he sort of has this kind of uh, not divine like figure on him, but he has the same kind of level of respect that a lot of Scientologists have with Ron Hubbard, but he's not equivalent to Ron Hubbard, but he's close up there. Uh, but however, it's really under his leadership that the church is just plastered with so many numbers of allegations. Um, and that's where the church has really been under pressure and under the law and been really sc scrutinized under his leadership. And so we have allegations and reports, um, but he, he's never, you know, he has never been charged, no has the church ever been charged 
officially, but a forced separation of family members, you know, where the church has taken and kidnapped children away from parents or kidnapped spouses away from each other or kid, you know, um, uh, Co- you know, like I have here, coercive fundraising practices that a lot of people see it as a huge tax scam and pyramid scheme that the church is doing. Uh, harassment, for sure. I've got friends who live in Tampa um, in the St. Pete area that have been harassed endlessly by the church. Uh, emotional and physical abuse that's been highlighted specifically by the HBO documentary series called Going Clear. Um, also, uh, the girl from the TV show uh, King of Queens and also just former uh, Scientologists who have come out in public have talked about uh, extensively the, the, the emotional and physical abuse. And two, I've had friends confirm this as well, um, illegal surveillance. And this is true. By me talking about Scientology... And by you watching this, because the, the, the video I have is placed on YouTube, we are, both you and me, are being illegally surveilled right now by the Church of Scientologists because we're talking about Scientology. It's, it's a known fact that if you Google Scientology, if you, you know, research, if you study about them, the church is surveilling you. And so I've had friends who, uh, they're lawyers in um, Clearwater, and they have caught members of the church spying on them, digging through their trash because uh, he was a lawyer for the city. And they were, the church was trying to b- purchase some land from Clearwater, um, city of Clearwater. And the Clear- city of Clearwater was not wanting to, to, to do it. And so he caught uh, several times, uh, I think twice, uh, two guys at two separate occasions digging through his trash who were members of the Church of Scientology. And more specifically, David uh, Miscavige, since I think 2017, has been accused of murdering his own wife uh, because she's missing and has not been seen since 2017 or maybe 16. Uh, so no one's seen her. And he's, you know, and so there's uh, people have speculated that he actually has murdered her, but we don't know. But however, the, the, today the Church of Scientology has a membership of about fifty-five thousand. Uh, it's probably up to sixty thousand to you know around today, but it, it fluctuates. I've seen some where they said they're actually losing membership. We're not sure, um, but they they claim a membership here in America of about fifty-five thousand people, but worldwide around two hundred thousand people and of course they're very popular among celebrities you know we all know tom cruise john travolta um christy alley uh, are very popular people who i self-identify uh with the church of scientology and i think there's and there's some people there's some famous people who have you know escaped the church too um what was it um kate you know tom cruise's ex-wife that uh um, from Dawson's Creek, she, you know, she was able to escape the church and has told a little bit about the stuff that's gone on. But as you can see, again, from all these groups, um, they're all very different and they represent something completely different than what we've seen from Mormonism, what we've seen from Jehovah's Witness, what we've even seen from the Oneida community. I mean, even though the United community had some weird behaviors, but it still operated within the field of Christianity. But this third wave of Christianity, because of globalization here in America, we see these religions just becoming something completely different. Whereas, you know, people, the people's temple, you know, is combining elements of Christianity, but with communism. And you have Heaven's Gate, that's UFO religions and terrestrial um, ideology. And then Scientology here of science fiction religion, as well as combining elements of Hinduism and Eastern philosophy and self-help and new ageism into a to a global religion now. <laughs>